All, All right. right. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> this, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us right away. Super exciting to have over 200 people RSVP for an online annual Zoom convention. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really amazing. And just like, I can imagine all of the possibilities. Um, I think, you know, when we're back in person, this thing is gonna be incredibly amazing. You know, 500 comrades all in person for a pre, uh, pre-convention banquet the night before. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of amazing possibilities if you consider that, you know, we just had over 200 people agree to check into this without, without even phone banking for it, which is pretty good. Um, so yeah, not to, you know, not to highlight our failings too much at all. <laughs> They're just, so yeah, uh, good morning comrades. So yes, thank you again for RSVPing and agreeing to like hang out on your Saturday with Austin DSA uh, for our 2021 annual convention. It's a weird year, weird convention, and I'm really excited to do this thing with y'all. And then I'm just, I'm really dang excited for the year ahead for Austin DSA and socialist organizing. Um, so what is a convention for those of you who are, um, who this might be your first one with Austin DSA or any socialist organization. Um, so yeah, every, you know, any kind of democratically operating body usually gets together uh, at least once a year and then usually more regularly. So for like conventions and general body meetings and that kind of thing to decide important chapter business um, and really, you know, set the tone for the period ahead. So, you know, we're, we're setting a, we're setting or setting a path forward for 2021. Uh, we'll be choosing our new leadership, uh, getting started on some of this big uh, infrastructure that we've set out to put in place for the year ahead and kicking off our year with a really exciting and important campaign. So yeah, we'll be setting the tone, getting some good debate in, reflecting all of this good stuff. Um, and then, so yeah, so this is a, a thing that democratic organizations do, should do, and we are a democratic organization. Um, you know, Democratic Socialists of America, we're fighting for democratic socialism. And part of that does require us to practice democracy um, in our own organizing. And, you know, uh, this is not just because democracy is desirable in itself, but because organizations run on oligarchic lines will not generate the popular political and administrative capacities that will be needed to radically transform the state. Um, so this, that line I just read was pulled from a retrospective on a comrade we just lost, Leo Panich, a very important scholar for our movement for democratic socialism. And yeah, I just thought it cap captured why we're, you know, trying to build our democratic capacities as an organization very well. Um, so yeah, we do these annually. Next year it will be either April or May, and then we also meet monthly. So any member of Austin DSA should at least have that general, you know, kind of like compass in your head for the year or like calendar in your head for the year, um, knowing that you have these organizing opportunities coming up every month and then every year. Uh, so yeah, look look forward to all of these meetings. Uh, these are the good ones, you know, the the big body meetings that fill up with fill us with hope and uh, comradely sentiment. And yeah, so pulling each other together to debate and uh, organize around these campaigns and structures is not just important for tone setting and you know like to get shit done, but it's also part of stressing the fact that socialist organizing is about the membership, you know, it's about setting members into action, um, into these active participatory organizing roles. And yeah, the meetings like this are a good way to do that. And we'll keep, you know, always improving on that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to j start with like a tiny history of Austin DSA conventions. Um, because yeah, this is our third annual convention. 
Um, you know, as many of y'all have heard by now, Democratic Socialists of America has been around for a, a while, uh, but it, in its current form, it is very new. It was a very different organization for a few decades. And then all of a sudden, because uh, Bernie Sanders ran for president and said democratic socialism again and again, and there were some people organizing on democratic socialism lines ready to absorb that interest, um, we exploded. So since then, uh, we've had three conventions here in Austin. Uh, two conventions ago when we started off this practice, we used it to kind of like set a course by choosing five different priorities. We focused on like, you know, choosing basically issues that we were really committed to for that year. So we chose health justice organizing, uh, reproductive justice organizing, uh, Green New Deal, which was a new thing then, um, and labor. And then we also agreed to prioritize building up our capacity as an organization. And then last year we, uh, we voted on priorities um, that were a little more kind of like the type of work. So we, we agreed to prioritize political education, um, YDSA building up our connection with college or call it campus organizing, uh, Green New Deal and other issue based campaigns, class struggle election campaigns, and then we kept, you know, we kept labor as a priority. And now this year I'm really excited uh, because we're kind of returning to the basics, uh, which is something I'm really passionate about. I really want to, us to be able to focus on building up these in, internal structures together um, because I believe that once we have the capacity and like a bunch of people engaged in these active intern or actively building the chapter and carrying out kind of the day-to-day -day operations, um, we're gonna be capable of some really great things. And we, we've already done great things and we're gonna keep doing great things once we like have these structures in place. So, you know, we're gonna keep doing labor organizing, class struggle campaigns, health and reproductive justice and Green New Deal campaigns um, while continuing to grow and actually, you know, do a better job of absorbing some of this growth. And um, I believe that'll be possible if our chapter uh, is gets a lot better at bringing a lot of a lot more people in to focus on the kind of internal organizing and day to day political tasks of just being a socialist organization. So, with the with my like little introductory speech, my last um, intro speech of my term as co chair, I hope to convince y'all of three things. Um, that is, uh, I hope that y'all can come away uh, confident to spend more of your time on the phone with comrades since we're gonna be in the pandemic for a little while longer. Um, it turns out that reaching out to people that you meet on Zoom uh, over the phone is actually very easy to do and very good for building these kinds of networks we need to grow and absorb new comrades. Uh, I hope to convince you to study some more, use some of your, uh, you know, time that you might be spending with friends and fam family, uh, studying labor and socialist history. It can be fun, especially if you do it with comrades. <laughs> um, and then help, and then also commit to helping us build this chapter capacity I keep speaking about. So later in the agenda, you know, we'll have these resolutions put forward from core organizers of these different chapter functions. And you know, you should think about which which one you might want to support and in what capacity, either as a core organizer or just somebody who wants to show up for a phone bank or, you know, come up with a really good tweet idea or something. So yeah, so you know, it it's 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 a weird year for a socialist organization. Um, I just wanted to reflect on some of the pandemic organizing. Um, so this year, you know, on the one hand, there's no shortage of system failure to point to. Um, you know, this week there was GameStop and healthcare, you know, every week there's healthcare workers losing their jobs or receiving pay cuts due to drop in elective surgeries during a healthcare crisis. Um, there is, you know, knowing that 
to fix this thing, we all need to stay home. But so many of us don't even have paid sick leave to like even stay home if you have symptoms. Uh, there's the fact that most workers still aren't in a union. <laughs> there is, despite, you know, kind of things sort of slowing down, there's still unceasing police violence against black and brown people, and especially against people who protest their violence. Um, there's huge increases in the wealth of the top wealthy people, like trillions of dollars. Um, how does that happen? Uh, there was the political consolidation around a senile neoliberal and then, you know, rising stock market amidst terrifying job loss, knowing the government can give us money anytime they want, but they resist it and they just flood Wall Street instead. Um, yeah, so the, I just, you know, listed off nine of kind of these obvious failures of the system that we so clearly see during the pandemic. And now's a good time. If you have a favorite uh, WTF capitalism moment during the pandemic, you can flood the chat. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's not actually a given that capitalism looks so bad. <laughs> it actually kind of uh, operates by convincing people that they're not oppressed, you know? So it is a rare time that it, everything around us doesn't look to be working. Um, but of course it's frustrating because it's not that easy to organize in a pandemic. You know, We've become painfully aware that making demands and really good arguments is not enough to transform society or even get $2,000 checks in our hands. Um, you know, especially in here in Austin, it's been especially painful to have our paid sick leave ordinances tied up in the courts for totally made up fake reasons that, you know, this legal system, is such a mockery. And, so, and then, um, and then, you know, it's been, it's been pretty obvious from the very beginning of the pandemic, from our perspective, what we would need to, to survive this thing and like actually, you know, handle it with a sense of equity and like justice, you know, we need Medicare for all, we need national stay at home orders and the money coming in to actually, you know, allow us to survive if we had to lock down. But no matter how many letters we post or, you know, tweets, tweet threads we fire off saying all of this, you know, states keep opening up and, you know, so, so it's become painfully obvious that making really, really good demands is not enough to win this kind of transformational change that will actually, you know, help us survive into the next generation. Um, so yeah, what, 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 what do we need then? We, we need power. And unfortunately right now we don't have a lot of it. Um, we thankfully have you know, more numbers on the left and like in the organized active socialist left than we have in a long time, but we really don't have much power or organized power. And then of course, during the pandemic, you know, even though we have these unprecedented numbers, we're really fighting with one hand behind our back, you know, not meeting in person really takes away a lot. Um, we don't have that kind of informal, sometimes random interactions that might generate new ideas or inspire us to get to work on one of our dormant ideas. Um, before the pandemic, we were able to make some of the grueling tasks a little easier by staying up late at comrades' houses to get bundles of lit together before a canvas or putting the finishing touches on a resolution. And you know, it's just hard to feel connected, especially to the constant flow of new people without ever seeing each other. So here's the point where I'm gonna like shoehorn in that uh, if you do see people make interesting points or point or like you think you might have something in common with somebody on a Zoom call, DM them or even non-DM, but publicly ask them to catch up after the call. It's a really cool thing to do. And it turns out people appreciate the heck out of a little uh, personal outreach, um, you know, and that's that's one reason why Slack can be nice because then you can find people's names on in their picture, um, even though you know Slack has its faults. But anyway, I digress. Um, so yeah, and then 
another, you know, another reason why it's hard to organize during the pandemic is just the very human reason that the pandemic has taken a toll on all of us. Um, our mental health is suffering. Our economic situations might be suffering. And then, of course, there's the mental health suffering from the economic situation suffering. And when when we're suffering and we're dealing with very like human when we're dealing with our human needs, uh, it can, you know, it can make it easy to fade in and out. And, and it's especially easy to do that when people can't just like approach you with an organizing question in person. And of course, you know, being forced to do everything online, who here is perfect at emails or text messages or social media. And so when that's all there is, it's really easy to kind of hide and disappear sometimes. Whereas at least in person, people usually notice if you're not showing up. And um, if you do show up, even if you have a lot going on, you know, your comrade can come and kind of grab you and pull you in and make a really convincing argument of why you should get active on some door-to-door uh, -door knocking or something. So, and then, you know, a, a third reason why, um, it's been hard to be, do socialist organizing during the pandemic is, so, you know, as a member of the leadership committee and I've, I'm working on this body of other committed leaders that are, were elected at the last convention, we're a nine person body. And, you know, as the committed chapter leadership who already knew each other before the pandemic hit and who are already kind of meeting regularly and, um, reliably with these this existing organizing con connection there's it's been kind of easy to feel like a little isolated from the rest of the chapter there's been moments where the work we do has felt a little bit top down um reminiscent of the way ngos work where a group of staff makes all of the decisions and then blasts out the call to action to an email list of volunteers and donors and you know even if we might do that for expediency from time to time or just to survive the pandemic, we definitely don't want our socialist organization to really ever get like that or for too long. So, so yeah, it became clear during the pandemic that we really needed to get serious about building up the institutional structures in order to build this capacity and get more people involved in the day-to-day -day political and chapter building work and learning uh, and learning critical lessons as they do it. Cause you know, that's the only way to really fully learn how to be a socialist organizer. So, you know, we lost these informal networks but part of good organizing and building up a serious socialist organization um, one that could act one day develop into a socialist party is formalizing these networks. Um, so we got to work restructuring our chapter so we can build the institutions necessary to bring strangers together on the phone maybe and transform them into comrades carrying out serious chapter and political work. But this infrastructure unfortunately is not built yet. So writing it down and writing it down on our bylaws is just one step, um, not even necessarily the first step. Most of the essential chapter infrastructure committees now at least have these core committed organizers who have brought forward these resolutions today. Um, and then after this convention, they'll be meeting regularly, which will hopefully draw some of y'all in. And then uh, various projects and programs will get going, which will draw more of you in and then spur more creative program design and organizing and institutionalize these networks. Um, but at the core of it, there will have to be dedicated organizing and of course, some patience with one another as we, you know, figure out our way forward. Um, I just wanted to end this pandemic section on a high note. Um, one positive for me, and I think a lot of my comrades this year is that there has been a lot more time, like I said earlier, since there isn't, you know, uh, going and hanging out with your friends and family, which sucks a lot. Um, I've been able to use some of that time for solo and collective study of theory and history and um, political education events have also been pretty low hanging fruit for our chapter to keep us together and keep us doing something. And it's something that can actually connect comrades from across the country. Um, so yeah, before, before I joined DSA, I had no background in uh, history or theory at all. I was a science um, person, engineering and science person, and then uh, 
this year after being in DSA for a couple of years, I made it through this guy on my first read. <laughs> it was really, you know, that's a, I only feel a comfortable bragging because I swear I come from a background of not having it at all. So I believe everyone can. And so, you know, I want to urge some urge, you know, while we're still in the pandemic, maybe, you know, consider when you're missing your friends, turn to this friend, you know, <laughs> sorry, it was a little cheesy. Um, so, you know, now I'm going to drive the point home that, you know, what we're doing is extremely his historically important. Um, and, you know, that can always be a little bit weird to say because we're living in like a very cynical kind of age, but, uh, yeah, I do these political speeches and kind of grandstand about capital and stuff because not because I, I don't know, not because I believe in my own like genius or anything, but just because I actually believe that what we're doing here is uh, important for the world, not, you know, being destroyed by climate change and um, for exploitation to end and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, what are, what are we, what are we doing that's so important? Um, what we're having to do and what we're gathered here to do, and what I hope we can keep doing with the kind of new chapter updates and what will be coming away from this is we are forming the working class. Um, we're gathered here to build up the forces that can transform society and overcome capitalist rule. So the recently departed Leo Panich said something like, a socialist party, uh, which we are on our way towards, is the mediating factor that makes it possible to create a collective subject called the working class and of the mass of individual working people. The basic role of a party, according to Panitch, is the reinforcement, recomposition, and extension of class identity and community itself in the face of a capitalism which continually deconstructed and reconstructed industry, occupation, and locale. So summarizing Marx, uh, Hadass Tier writes in A People's Guide to Capital, or Capitalism, Marx distinguished between the working class as a class in itself, defined by a common relationship to the means of production and a class for itself, organized in active pursuit of its own interests. So what we've been harping on the last couple of years in DSA is that first part, the class in itself. We are all working class here in DSA because we have a common relationship to the means of production, and given the scattered nature of class politics in our current age, there's really limited value in dividing up, dividing us up to determine who is or who is not working class based on how like good your job is or how, you know, whether or not you work from home or not right now. But, uh, you know, it's extremely important to recognize that first part that we're fighting for ourselves um, or that we are a class because, you know, it's cool to know because we are the vast majority of society. The vast majority of society either live from or either have to earn their own paycheck from you know working for another person or live off somebody else like their parents or something that uh, works for the boss. And then you know of course it's important because we are the class that's positioned to actually upend the system. And so yeah, now that we kind of have a good sense in DSA that we are working class and what that means, um, we have to focus on that second part, becoming a class for itself. Um, because today the cl working class is not a class for itself. It is not yet organized in active pursuit of its own interests. So yeah, capitalism, and this is a quote from Chris Maizano, who recently wrote a retrospective on Leo Panitch um, and was on our national political committee the last term. Capitalism may have brought a mass of proletarians into existence, which includes us, but it did not automatically create a working class. Class formation is something only parties can achieve in their role as articulators of a collective working class political identity. So yeah, um, that's what we're working towards. We wanna to be a party one day and we wanna be a socialist party. We have to do that because that's how we form a working class that can actually fight for itself and um, overthrow the most powerful people on earth. And that's why it's worth Kind of wading through this pandemic. Uh, that's why it's worth diving into uh, challenging books while we're not, you know, partying as much. And that's why it's worth, you know, the frustrations of figuring out some of these weird quirks of building up a democratic socialist organization. 
And it's worth committing your life to socialist organi organizing, or I hope I can convince you of that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my speech for today. And uh, I, I am about to pass it over to our keynote speaker, Farah. We have a couple of business items that I did not squeeze in well enough into that. So we'll just have to get to it after our speaker. Um, that's not the order. That's not the order? Yeah. But why can't we hear from? Farah's at a different time. Farah's at 11, or? Farah's at 12.30. Oh my God. Sorry, <laughs> I got so confused with Eastern time. That's okay. That's, okay, that's okay. Started to see the time. Oh my God. Okay, never mind. In one hour, we will hear from Farah, and I will have a little more time to uh, collect my thoughts on that. Um, so yeah, I was just going to say that we're going to hear from a lot of different comrades today. So I don't really mind if y'all tuned out what I said, but I do hope that um, you do pay attention when all of the other people are, people are speaking. We invited a lot of people to give speeches and um, various, you know, comments today, and they probably put a lot of work into it. So, you know, Zoom is really hard, but I definitely implore you when uh, your comrades are speaking to try to pay attention, try to write things down. If somebody says something interesting or challenging, find their name on Slack or DM them on the chat and uh, try to get on the phone with them in the week, next week or two to hash it out and uh, form an organizing relationship. So yes, uh, what is next? <laughs> okay, so you want to mute? Uh, just one moment, comrade. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Madeline. That was awesome. So you'll see that next on our agenda is that we're voting on convention rules. So um, actually, as Madeline talked about in her speech, I'm going to direct these, I'm going to link these convention rules right now so you can take a look at them. Um, but it was sent out to everyone last night. So as um, Madeline talked about in her speech, democracy is extremely important to practice in DSA. Um, and it's also a lot of work to like do and put on, and carry through and, and so on. So we're doing the best that we can during the pandemic to kind of familiarize ourselves with like robust democratic procedures. But we're taking into account that, you know, it's not possible to have the kind of like lively debate and read people's body language and respond to like the crowd and so on in a way that you would in an in-person meeting. So we have these convention rules, which are based on Robert's rules. Um, there's an explanation further in the convention packet on Robert's rules. It's basically like the idea is that de for democracy to be, for a, democrat for a democratic system to exist, the rules have to be like clear and accessible, right? So like if you're debating what the chapter does, there needs to be a clear like resolution that talks about why this is an important use of all of our time and what the like actionable things that we're voting on are, that sort of thing. So anyway, all that to say that we have some convention rules that try to adapt those principles to this, um, to our meeting today. And we are just gonna vote on them. We've done this at the monthly meetings as well uh, in the, in the, over, the, over the course of the pandemic where we put forward kind of temporary rules um, to govern our democratic deliberations. So giving everyone a second to look at it. I think, um, Alex, are you gonna share a link to the, um, well, I suppose I could share the link um, to the vote. Okay, Alex will do it. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, so we're gonna vote on that briefly um, to ju just kind of like ground ourselves in agreeing that these are the rules that we're gonna operate by today. Um, so let's take a second to vote on that. Oh. Recall that uh, today's meeting is, you know, open to the public as it were, um, but to vote on anything and to have speaking rights or anything like that today, uh, you'll need to be a member um, of Austin DSA. And if you're here and you're not a member, then I'm gonna drop the link to join DSA. And you should say if you joined, so we can all congratulate you. While everyone's voting, Wait, how do you vote? Uh, Subu, the link that Alex sent is the vote link. Vote here, send it again. Um, yeah, thank you, Alex. That's the voting form. Um, we're gonna give it a second and Alex will tell us what the grand result is. I really hope this passed because I don't know what to do if we don't pass it. Um, 
kind of go through a debate. Yeah, I guess so. Alex, whenever you feel like enough votes have been put in, then you can let us know what the response is. And then we can move on to the next section of the agenda. Um, well, first we'll introduce our parliamentarian now that we've approved the rules, but or after we approve the rules, and then we'll move on to the next section of the agenda. So Alex, do you think we're good? I do, yes. Uh, so we've got 75 votes in. So even if the rest of folks abstained, it would pass uh, because we have 76 approved. Wow, 75 votes and 76 yeses. That's incredible. We're re doing really great at Democracy Comrades. Thank you. Um, was, okay. Um, before we move on, I want to introduce Graham Denovan. So as earlier, I was talking about um, the importance of investing in our democratic capacities. Uh, Graham was actually, Graham is an East Bay DSA member, and he actually chaired, he was the chair for Austin DSA's first annual convention, um, which had a lot of lively discussion and debate back and forth over our political program. And he, uh, we were still, as we are now, learning what it means to engage in comradely discourse and debate. And Graham's uh, experience in, 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 in managing those debates and, and sharing those kinds of things really helped guide us to make our points in a productive, constructive manner. Um, and we thought he did such a good job that we invited Graham back. So Graham, if you just want to say hello. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I was uh, in Austin two years ago um, to chair your convention. Um, it was a really great time. And it's really great to see a lot of familiar faces because that means people are sticking around to uh, help build this project. And actually a lot of familiar faces on this Zoom call are familiar names. Um, so that's really cool. I. Um, I've chaired quite a few um, DSA meetings and also other meetings in other areas like my union, the Service Employees International Union, or um, in other democratic spaces. So yeah, just really excited to be here with you all. Um, hopefully able to help everyone learn how to uh, do uh, democratic deliberation together. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, Graham's gonna chair the rest of the convention. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to say is that Graham, Graham being a member of East Bay DSA is a great reminder to us all that we're not just Austin DSA members, we're members of the Democratic Socialists of America, a 90,000 strong socialist organization, the likes of which has not been seen. So we should always keep in mind the kind of like really ambitious transformative goals that we're working on and our, and our access to so many wonderful comrades across the country who, you know, we all have so much to learn from each other, including how to do democracy. Okay. Graham's now the chair. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Ashkan. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, let's, let's um, get started. So it looks like we're going to hear from um, people reporting back on your various campaigns. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get into that. Um, so first up, it looks like we have um, Oh, and the there's a section on here that's just says Robert's rules overview. Um, and I think just the basic principle and that, that'll come up later. But I think just the basic principle is it's like a set of organized rules that are used to help everyone um, come together and make decisions. Um, I don't think you need to learn a lot about the procedure or the, um, you know, finer points. I think just remember to come, you know, and be ready to make your your debate points to debate the political issues in front of us today. Um, and kind of let the procedure fall to the side to make way for the um, political debate. So yeah, um, first up is going to be these report backs. Um, and the first report back is coming from Jack uh, with uh, the Heidi Sloan campaign. Jack and I used to be in the same chapter. Hi, Jack. We did. Thank you so much, Graham. It's great to see you. Thanks for, thanks for chairing our meeting today. Um, so hello, comrades. Uh, my name is Jack McShane. I use he, him pronouns. I'm an outgoing member of our leadership committee here in Austin DSA. And I actually moved to Austin to work on the Heidi campaign. Um, and it was a really, really incredible life-changing experience. Um, so during this period, uh, during this like section on the agenda, we're supposed to talk about Kind of the goals for these specific campaigns we're doing report backs from and whether we met the goals. Um, so the goals were pretty simple. Uh, it was to win a congressional seat for the working class and build the socialist movement here in Austin, organizing the working class in the process. So we didn't win the seat, unfortunately, um, but we did, uh, hold on one second. Got to uh, sorry, my notes just went to the other screen. 
Um, <laughs> what the hell? Anyway, okay, so we didn't win the seat in Austin, but we did do um, an incredible job, I think, uh, building our chapter here in Austin BSA. Um, and <laughs> sorry, putting this up. Where the hell? Okay. Um, we, um, sorry, one second, everyone. Okay, here we go. Um, we also showed what a mass working class campaign for Congress should look like. Um, I met so many of you comrades uh, during Heidi canvases. Um, how many people here, uh, yeah, joined Austin DSA through our campaign for Heidi Sloan? Uh, definitely recognize a few faces in this crowd who did. Um, so that's incredible. Uh, we also tried to reframe politics along class lines here in Central Texas. You know, I mean, I think we're all used to so many like kind of blah uh, progressive Democrats who, you know, claim this progressive mantle and uh, clearly just will obviously side with the capitalist class when push comes to shove. And I think that we did an incredible job kind of really showing like what those lines are and, you know, whose side uh, we were on and whose side our opponent was on. Um, we absolutely, speaking of our opponent, uh, pushed our primary opponent to the left. Uh, she ran back in 2018 didn't run on Medicare for all, didn't run on a Green New Deal. Um, and, you know, by the end of this campaign, she was trying to like one up us basically. Like, you know, we, we supported Bernie Sanders call for uh, a wage floor of uh, $50,000 for public school teachers. And she was like, oh, well, I want $60,000 for public school teachers. Like, you know, it clearly became a campaign of like, appealing to like progressive voters and uh, left working class voters in Austin. And I think that, you know, had we not run in this campaign, it absolutely would not, that, that would not have been the case. Um, I think that, you know, the big thing that we tried to, since our primary opponent was really just adopting all of the policies and the language that we were running on, you know, the thing that we set out to do was convince people that it's not just about the policies. It's not just about like what you say you're going to do. It's about being an organizer in office, right? It's about knowing that we're not going to legislate our way to a better world. We're, we need to build a working class movement to realize the better world that we need. And, uh, you know, that's the way that things have always changed. And that's the way that things are, are going to change for the better now. The tricky thing is to uh, try to talk to someone and like convince someone of that in a very short canvassing conversation. And honestly, ultimately, I think that's why we um, did not prevail on election day is because we have really have to do a lot more deeper uh, working class organizing here in Austin, whether that means at the workplace or just um, you know continuing to build this kind of like working class political identity through running in more electoral campaigns and distinguishing ourselves from like the rest of like the Texas Democratic Party political establishment. Um, and so I think that we learned a lot about kind of where working class politics is in Austin. Um, and uh, we also learned a ton of just nuts and bolts uh, knowledge of like how to run an electoral campaign. And uh, I think that, you know, none of us would have predicted that the pandemic would hit like a week after our campaign wrapped up. But I firmly believe that like the momentum and power that we built through this campaign really has carried us through the rest of this year and allowed our chapter to continue growing and continue um, you know, running campaigns in a, in a really, really, really difficult uh, setting of not being able to organize with each other in person. And finally, I just wanna say that you know, none of this would have been possible 
without our incredibly courageous um, socialist hero comrade Heidi Sloan for going out on a limb and running for office as one of the first uh, true DSA congressional can candidates. Um, we all owe Heidi such a huge debt. The socialist movement owes Heidi such a huge debt for devoting a year of her life to running for office and kind of like being a candidate and all of the like, you know, just weird stuff that that entails of like what it's like for, for your name to become like, you know, it's, it's the Heidi campaign. Like that is, that is forever her name. Um, and so, um, it was really, you know, I mean, I, I would not have found myself here in Austin DSA. I wouldn't have moved here if it weren't um, for Heidi deciding to run. And, um, you know, we have a lot to learn about how we need to like continue to recruit candidates from our own chapter to run for office, how we can support them. Um, and, uh, you know, how we're gonna continue growing this movement through electoral politics and through um, organizing the working class in other terrains like the workplace. Um, so overall, even though the campaign was not successful um, in the strict electoral sense, I think the campaign was a huge success in showing us exactly how we can organize on a mass scale here in Austin and also just like what it feels like to be part of a legit movement here in Central Texas. I mean, I think that I can speak for um, a lot of us that like the feeling of being like at a big canvas and being like meeting, um, you know, just dozens of comrades who are like showing up for the first time to, to like get involved in socialist organizing for the first time was a very incredible and moving experience that I'm really excited to continue just as soon as this pandemic is over. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the report back from the Heidi campaign. Thanks comrades. Thanks Jack. Um, so next up we have uh, the DSA for uh, Bernie campaign. Uh, that'll be, that report back will be from Oshkon and I think They've budgeted about four minutes for each person, so we will try and keep that to uh, start off our day on uh, on track. Yeah, in fact, I'll even try to keep it between two and three minutes, and if everyone else does that, then we can get through the rest of the campaigns. But if we don't, then that's okay too. Um, so yeah, just to talk about, I'll set a timer for myself, just to talk about the DSA for Bernie campaign. Okay, we are all here. It's very important to recognize this, I think. Um, very important for the sake of future socialist strategy that we are all here because Bernie Sanders ran for president in 2016. Like that happened and that built, that exploded DSA. Um, and of course it was uh, piling on, on top of a lot of important work that had happened in the past, but it really started to give um, political expression to a new socialist movement. So the goals for the DSA for Bernie campaign were to build socialism, you know, expand our ranks, train new socialist organizers, and to elect Bernie. Okay, so I can ask you, did we succeed? Um, yes and no. Okay, Bernie's not president, which is a, a, a crime, you know, to say the least. And, um, but however, like so many of us are here uh, because of Bernie's 2020 campaign. In fact, a lot of the good stuff about this overlaps with Heidi, uh, Heidi Sloan's campaign and the rest of our local slate with Dominic Silvera and Jose Garza. But um, the Bernie 2020 campaign was the greatest thing our chapter has ever done. And the reason for that is because every single day we could have events, we could have canvases, happy hours, watch parties, any excuse to get people who were excited about Bernie, excited about Bernie's politics under the same roof and talk to each other about how like, huh, the world really could be better. And huh, maybe we could like organize our way there. And we just got to do that every day. I mean, that's like what there is to do, you know, um, for now, it's just like build our ranks, you know, on, on the roads, having a socialist party. And so many of us got like, so like trained in the heat of the moment. So like, I'll give you a concrete example. I was already in DSA for a couple of years before the Bernie 2020 campaign, but I still didn't really have like an organizer instinct. Um, and I developed that through the Bernie campaign. So um, I was at a socialist night school, an in-person one, good times. And before the meeting, I was just kind of like talking to like some of my friends. Um, but actually, Jack McShane came up to me and he said, hey, a lot of people, a lot of new people are here. 
why don't you go talk to them and ask them why they joined DSA and start to like invite them more into DSA and turn DSA into more of this like inclusive mass oriented or mass movement. And uh, ever since then, I've, whenever I go into a DSA meeting, you know, I say hello to my friends, but I really try to focus on the comrades who I don't know to try to bring them one step closer in. And that's just kind of like a small example of the kind of like organizer training that we had the opportunity to learn and to like expand on all the time. Um, I could talk about the Bernie campaign for another hour. Maybe we'll do a separate event. Um, but I just want to say that like it, it actually, as good as it was, it could have been even better. So like Marxism is about being able to judge uh, your historically determined conditions in order to figure out like sound socialist strategy. You can make predictions about the what the best use of our limited resources is. And so in January of 2019, uh, myself and a few other Marxist organizers tried to pass a resolution uh, or a priority resolution at the first at the first Austin DSA convention um, to make the Bernie campaign a priority, but it was rejected by comrades who identified with more of a um, you know, the kind of like uh, non electoral politics that were much more popular in the late 90s and the early 2000s when the American socialist movement was non existent. This is one of the, that was one of the only times a campaign in Austin DSA has been voted down the last three years. And it's important to recognize that it was a big mistake to do that. By November, Bernie Mania had already lit the country up and attracted millions of people to socialist politics. And um, we jumped on that opportunity once it became that much more obvious. Um, but it's important to recognize those opportunities in the future. I don't know what the next Bernie campaign is going to look like, but we have to be able to do what we're doing here today, which is build ourselves up and consolidate as a chapter in order to be able to take advantage of the next opportunity as much as possible, because those opportunities don't come around all the time. And we want to make that next big leap. Nina Turner, AOC, all of that. Absolutely. So yeah, thanks, comrades. I'll hand it off to Seneca. Great. Um, thanks, Ashkan. Um, and it looks like we have about 40 minutes left um, in this section and about 14 more, um, or wait, about 12 more speakers. So yeah, if everyone could try and do uh, three, three and a half minutes, that'd be great. Um, so next up is Dominic, the uh, Dominic Salvera for Travis County Attorney report back from Seneca. Hey. Um... The, we we're switching over from Tanner's audio to mine, so hopefully I, I picked the right moment uh, to come on. Uh, yeah, so the Dominic Silvera campaign um, was um, kind of unique in what it displayed um, about the chapter. So the the main thing that stands out about Dominic is that um, the consensus on every single criminal justice reformer uh, I've talked to in the country who knows about him is that he is the most progressive person to have ever run um, for a prosecutor seat in the country um, with the most abolitionist platform, right? Um, that's including like, you know, Tiffany Caban and like some pre pretty radical people. Um, and when we started the Dominic race, Dominic did not have an existing following, an existing social base, right? And so we started the Dominic campaign and the endorsement in electoral research group, um, not primarily with the intent of Dominic winning, um, but of essentially shifting the conversation uh, in the county attorney race. On that count, it was an unmitigated success. Uh, Dominic uh, created more rhetorical space uh, for uh, Jose Garza, um, one of our other class struggle candidates, uh, to be able to say more and more radical things in public and for it to seem normal, right? Because he had backup at every single event that he went to. Um, we were able to build high levels of activation, uh, particularly among the youth segment, right? Like normally there's no way in hell um, that students are going to get involved in a race for a county attorney, not even district attorney. Mm -hmm. um, but Dominic was able to create high levels of mobilization uh, around things like decriminalizing sex work, homelessness, um, and uh, drug possession. Now, there are some major areas of opportunity. One, um, while we recruited Dominic very early as part of one of our pressure campaigns around homes, not handcuffs, um, we did not start our endorsement process very early, right? Which means that we weren't turning on um, the, the spigots to, to turn out votes for him uh, very early on. We weren't going to try and gin up endorsements until later on. Uh, second of all, um, we did have some issues making sure that we um, created a habit of doing slate canvassing um, when we were doing our combined Heidi Bernie stuff. And um, that was something that we sorted out later on. People thought it'd be more difficult to talk about multiple things at the door. It turned out to be easier, 
right? Um, so we definitely left some, uh, some on the table. But just again, to, to recognize the victories we do have, uh, Dominic is an assistant district attorney um, within one of the most progressive uh, and <laughs> frankly, most socialist um, district attorney uh, offices in the country. Um, his former opponent, Delia Garza, uh, not only adopted his entire platform, um, but uh, also was the key vote that got a defund to happen right in, in uh, Austin, right? Um, so Dominic shifted many people's uh, opinions about what's possible in criminal justice left, uh, but there are a lot of things in terms of field, in terms of endorsement process, et cetera, um, that can be learned in order to make sure the next Dominic is more effective, uh, or even if the next Dominic is just Dominic. Um, <laughs> And finally, the last thing, we remember that the reason that the Dominic joined is not because he was an existing DSA member, but because he showed up to one of our Homes on Handcuffs uh, canvases. Um, this means that when we run issue canvases or issue campaigns that involve a broader coalition, um, that we have to actively use those opportunities um, to look for natural leaders um, from broader social movements, bring them into DSA, um, and ask them to run for shit if they have a social follow. Great, thank you, Seneca, um, and good to see you. And uh, next up is going to be uh, the Jose Garza for Travis County District Attorney Report back from Frank. Hi, that's me. Uh, so hi, I'm Frank, uh, him, and uh, talking about the uh, Jose Garza campaign for a district attorney. Uh, the goals I think for this campaign were to elect a uh, district attorney who uh, represented the working class and uh, shifted criminal justice priorities away from punishing people who are the working class and uh, forcing them to, uh, and holding elites accountable in our county. Um, so with that in mind, his campaign focused a lot on end cash bail and the war on drugs, ending criminalization of poverty, holding police accountable, ending the death penalty and uh, getting a socialist and <laughs> elected to the DA. Um, and yeah, uh, Jose is a DSA member now and we won that election. And uh, another campaign, uh, a, a goal that we hadn't talked about, I think gets swept off the rug is getting rid of our previously terrible DA, uh, Margaret Moore, um, getting her out of there and making sure that people who had been uh, uh, <laughs> previously swept under the rug, victims of sexual assault uh, were got to see, <laughs> are now gonna get to see their uh, uh, their justice. Um, a, lot of this, a lot of the outcomes of this campaign are still yet to be seen because uh, Jose is only a month in uh, office, but from the headlines that I'm sure we've all seen, uh, there's a lot, good, a lot of good stuff going on. We're holding a lot of uh, police officers accountable um, we are, uh, he put out a letter announcing his campaign priorities. Uh, we are decriminalizing drugs. We are creating a do not call list for police officers that have a campaign, that have a history of, uh, unethical behavior. Rosa Jimenez, who has been a high profile, uh, case, uh, for the Innocence Project is going to get her time in court and will likely be released. Uh, we have a victim services department run by Aaron Mortensen, which is gonna be great. And finally, yep, as Jake is mentioning, the, the biggest part is that he's created a special department to hold landlords and bosses accountable for wage theft and illegal evictions and all those kinds of things, which is great. This is what happens when a workers defense person becomes DA, I guess. Um, and yeah, so all in all, it's a very good, campaign that we won a lot of good stuff from, but we need to continue to hold them accountable. Uh, so a lot to be seen. I'm done talking, thanks. Oh, great. All right, thanks, Frank. Uh, thanks for that great report back and congratulations everyone on the win. I think I remember seeing this guy on uh, TV uh, once, uh, national television. Um, Okay, uh, next up on the report backs is um, the Abortion Access Fundathon with a report back from Cece. Thank you. Hi, Cece, she, her pronouns. Um, so, yeah, this was the first year that Bullathon became Fundathon. Um, 
And uh, Autism DSA and DSA in general has a long history of supporting this fundraiser for uh, abortion access. Um, so when we met to plan uh, for 2020's Fundathon in February and March, we set our most aggressive fundraising goal ever of $20,000, which was really kind of an aggressive goal uh, based on having kind of exceeded year over year uh, the goals that we'd set in the past. Um, we also really recognized that our fundraising activities and events had the uh, capacity to bring in new members to Austin DSA uh, who are already passionate about abortion rights and to connect them to the concepts of reproductive justice, abortion access, uh, and our project to win socialism more generally. Um, so Fundathon typically runs from February to May. So no big spoilers, but you might anticipate where the story's headed a little bit. Um, we got some amazing events in at the beginning, but unfortunately a lot of the in-person planned events we had had to be canceled or moved to an online venue. So we had a very successful bake sale at the February general body meeting. Uh, we had an amazing skate party organized by the Heidi campaign, which really lives in my mind as like one of the last uh, most like beautiful things uh, that we did all together um, for socialism before uh, we all had to kind of hole up inside. Uh, some other things we had planned that we unfortunately had to cancel were uh, another bake sale, uh, trivia in partnership with Geeks Who Drink, a movie screening, a chili cook-off, um, and an end of fundathon party. Um, but uh, when kind of things went into quarantine, we pivoted uh, our planned trivia night um, to be over Zoom and took the opportunity to give it kind of more of a political education flavor, focusing on questions on abortion and abortion access. Uh, big thanks to Kim for pretty much organizing um, uh, the bulk of that. Um, so uh, yeah, um, in March, uh, there were lots of opportunistic and confusing abortion bans, which were being instated in Texas as well, which really threw into harsh relief that uh, the work that we were doing uh, for raising money for abortion funds was um, as important as ever, uh, making abortion accessible to everyone, not just those who can afford it. Um, at that same time, we were kind of observing that we felt a little less comfortable asking our friends and family for money at a time when uh, so many were facing sudden financial instability due to the pandemic um, and kind of figuring out what this new fundraising situation meant for us. But despite all the unexpected changes to our plans, uh, Austin DSA teams still raised just under $9,000 total for abortion funds across Texas. Um, yeah, so these were the early days of quarantine. As a chapter, we've learned a lot about online organizing since then. In March, it was all like really new. Uh, it's a yearly campaign and the need definitely hasn't abated like a single bit. Um, not to mention that we have a new Texas Ledge in session uh, who are absolutely already scheming ways to coerce working class people into carrying unwanted pregnancies to term. So uh, look for more from us very soon about the next Fundathon. Um, that's it, thanks. Great, thanks Cece. Um, and I know we've all attended lots of like webinars during the pandemic or like online meetings. And it's just so nice to see the chat is just full of people like appreciating the speaker and other people in the campaigns and how good they were. Like that's that's really neat and special. I think you all should be proud for uh, having that like great community even while we're online, especially while we're online. Um, <laughs> All right, so next up on the um, report backs is going to be uh, the defund the police report back by uh, Anna or Anna. Yeah, uh, my name's Anna. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and yes, fuck the police. Um, I would say, so the goal of this campaign was to defund Austin Police Department. Um, but I would also say the goal was to kind of get the chapter um, out doing actions, you know, um, we, we had already, the Austin Police Department murdered um, somebody here in Austin prior to the George Floyd murder. Um, but really whenever the country was incredibly galvanized and in the streets, um, it was a great opportunity for Austin DSA to, you know, point to the fact that like these problems have been going on for a long time. And um, this was happening in the larger context of, you know, the fight to decriminalize homelessness um, and, and other stuff that had already been going on. So um, we were successful. We, we, you know, our council was defunded the police by um, $150 million. 
So only 21 million of that was immediate, but this was a huge win. Um, we defunded by more than like any other city in the country. Um, and I think we were really successful in organizing um, our membership to do really great testimony at city council. Um, we did great research to try to find alternatives um, to not just oppose the police, but um, offer solutions for the community and, and ways that we could spend that money to help people out. Um, but you know, it was it was also really challenging because all all of this campaign happened through Zoom. Even though we were organizing protests, we did a really great event with grassroots leadership and communities of color united. That was like a trial of APD. Um, it was hard for people to come out to the events. You know, it was in the middle of a pandemic and people were unsure about, you know, whether it was safe. Um, so that was a huge challenge, but despite all of that, we still had several really great um, demonstrations. We on another member organized um, a protest outside of another council member's home, um, and it was very respectful and great. Um, yeah, we were able to, through our WhatsApp chat, offer some mutual aid. I saw people, you know, offering rides when one of our comrades got... Um, shot with the one of the rubber bullets the first weekend of protests people were like making food for him and like helping him out and it was really great to see all of that um yeah so i guess some things we could do better uh, at the beginning of the campaign it was like we had a kind of really clear structure of how um, people could organize other members uh, to get involved with the campaign and um you know, it, it was really fast paced and we were still adjusting to online. So I think we missed an opportunity to really engage a lot of the membership. And towards the end, you know, we had weekly meetings about defund APD um, that people just didn't even know were happening. So I really think there was an opportunity to bring more people in because this was like, you know, the country was was ready to get in the streets for Black Lives Matter. Um, and and we should think about how we can, you know, get people from, you know, angry to actually organizing their friends and coworkers and family um, to do stuff. So it was a win, but uh, we only defunded by 20 million. We still have to abolish the police. And um, as most of you know, we have horrible state leadership that is, you know, threatening to bring state police to Austin. So this fight is not over. And and we definitely need to continue to organize and so that we can mobilize and, and get in the streets whenever something horrible happens. Great, uh, thanks Anna. Um, and so next up on the report backs will be um, Green New Deal organizing with Jeff G. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeff, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I was a uh, co-chair of the Eco-Socialist Working Group at the time of this uh, carbon-free campaign we ran in 2019-2020. So you see in the packet there the goals. The main goal externally was to decarbonize uh, energy generation in the city by accelerating the shutdown of a couple of gas plants that burn frack gas from the mostly from West Texas and shut down the city's interest in the Fayette coal plant. Um, as a part of that, you know, you close down plants, uh, you decarbonize the economy, you're gonna affect jobs, you're gonna shut down jobs. So uh, as part of that, we also demanded that the workers in those plants be provided training and a transition to good similar jobs. Um, this is a tricky issue to deal with in climate organizing, uh, but it's very key to confront it and organize through it. Um, another thing um, about the plan we tried to get in there was some racial and economic equity provisions like protection for investments in vulnerable and frontline communities. Um, I'd say the main goal really though was uh, internal uh, to build the working group's capacity and skills and to bring Austin DSA into what was a fairly new uh, Green New Deal uh, environment for organizing Green New Deal um, Resolution had in Congress had been uh, introduced in February of that year, uh, 2019, and we got started late uh, later in that year. 
So the working group was very new at that time and we wanted and had never taken on a sustained campaign and we wanted to build our capacity and bring Austin DSA into the Green New Deal organizing environment. Um, and we wanted to build relationships with uh, across Austin and raise our uh, profile in environmental organizing in the city. The results were mixed. Um, we did not win uh, the accelerated decar plan we wanted. It ended up being zero carbon by 2030. Um, there's more to come on that. We did succeed though in our main internal goal of building the working group. Um, we, we, uh, we built a lot of capacity, especially canvassing skills. We created uh, some great campaign materials and resources. We mobilized a bunch of members to a bunch of canvases, including some combined electoral canvases with Heidi Bernie on Green New Deal. Uh, and a key accomplishment I'd say was building a good working relationship with Sunrise Austin here, and all, but also with more uh, radical folks in other organizations like 350 and Sierra. Um, we surfaced the issues though, the problems with decarbonize the economy in this city um, although we didn't, we did get some equity provisions in the plan uh, and we ensured the plan will be reviewed again in two years rather than five, uh, which is very important when you're working against an existential timeline like the climate crisis. Um, but we, you know, what we ran up against were major shortcomings in the city process around democratic decision making and equitable community representation. Uh, this process is a, a very uh, hidden and opaque process uh, run by a committee, run by a guy, run by a white dude and who picks most of the people and then a bunch of experts at Austin Energy. The city is kind of beholden in some ways to Austin Energy because of its revenues. It becomes a revenue stream for the city. So the city is sensitive about dealing with Austin Energy. Um, and we saw how policy that can set living conditions for so many is controlled by those experts and insiders who have a disproportionate influence. So um, the, those issues though were, we did help with Sunrise, especially we did help bring those uh, issues to the attention of council in an impactful way. And I think going forward, we're gonna have uh, inroads and ways to, to deal with those things in a more effective way. Um, I mean, I'd say the bottom line for a campaign like this is it's, it's tough uh, to decarbonize the economy when basically uh, oil and gas are the lifeblood of our economy. Um, and uh, direct attacks on carbon emissions always raise these problems with the lack of democracy and, and popular input and process and also with tricky labor organizing problems because shutting down fossil fuels means shutting down jobs. So. Um, for the future, currently, we're beginning planning for a new campaign that will be more of an indirect, uh, actually, decarbonation campaign. So we're looking at uh, researching and figuring out some local demands as yet unknown that we can combine with current national demands for the Green New Deal campaign uh, to pass the PRO Act, to build massive green investment in public work, and to build momentum for a green federal job guarantee. Um, those are uh, to come. And so if you're interested in this kind of work, stay tuned, get in touch. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and next up, we have um, next report back will be from uh, Crystal M on the restaurant organizing project. And I'll remind everyone, try and do three minutes just so we don't accidentally cut the people off at the, the, the bottom of the list. Thanks, everyone. Go ahead, Crystal. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Crystal Keeher Pronouns, and I'm an organizer with Restaurant Organizing Project. So um, part of what ROP was, it was like a national initiative to uh, that came out of the COVID crisis. And the main goals were, we wanted to connect with workers um, who were currently at work during the pandemic and facing da dangerous conditions. Um, so it was a big kind of protection for uh, folks during COVID and making sure that they were going to be, you know, getting PPE and all that kind of good stuff. Um, the other main goal is just building a network of restaurant workers. 
uh, as we hear on a lot of these organizing calls, restaurant workers are basically impossible to organize. It's like herding cats and uh, there's high turnover. So it's really hard to try and get like a workplace to unionize when folks don't see themselves even being in that workplace in maybe a year or two's time. Um, during COVID, it was challenging to have in-person protests, but we did successfully have a few in-person actions, which was like incredible. Uh, we have a poster here from one we did in the summer, which was a big food drive that we were able to do. That, that was like an incredibly successful campaign for us. Um, we learn a lot by having one protest uh, in, the, like in around July where we were protesting Cornyn for unemployed workers to extend the $600. Uh, a lot of our industry, of course, is still unemployed to this very day. And on top of that, um, when we did that second protest, we decided food insecurity was going to be a thing. So we did a food bank, but it really helped us connect with not just workers, but our community to show that, hey, there's a body here that can speak for restaurant workers and actually take care of them. Uh, in Austin, like all we really have are these groups and across the country, Texas Restaurant Association. Uh, now we've got Independent Restaurant Coalition all popping up to be like the voice of workers, but they're really just lobbyists or bosses. Um, a current campaign we've been working on uh, and we were working on last year is pushing to get language amended in the restaurant app to make sure that it is worker friendly because currently the new proposed restaurant tax is just like a billion dollar payout for bosses and there's no guarantee that they have to use that money on providing jobs for workers. So Gina's dropping some links in the chat for you. Uh, she's my organizing partner in crime with RFP. And uh, we wrote an article about one of our comrades in Jacobin to explain a little bit more and connect more to workers about like, hey, this is why this language is bad for you. You do have a voice in this and we can actually help you be a voice and teach you how to do things like get on phones with your state representatives and your Congress people. Uh, this is how you can have a conversation with them. So we were really successful in connecting workers with getting on calls with Cornyn's office throughout the summer to advocate for themselves to get that extra $600. Um, we were super successful in getting folks to uh, record videos for this current Restaurants Act campaign that we're doing to keep pushing that story through that like, hey, we're still getting super affected by this. You keep saying that we're essential workers, but you're not treating us that way. Um, and currently now through our national and our Texas uh, Austin, Texas chapter, we're getting folks like 30 to 40 people on the national calls and 15 to 20 people on our like Austin chapter calls. So like when we have a call out to come, you know, organize with us or when we have an action, people really do want to get involved. Um, we made sure to really focus this year on social media because that's how folks are going to be connecting with us when we can't get in person. So we do have a few channels which I'm gonna drop in the chat here when we're done, uh, where we're gonna keep connecting with workers. And that's how they've been reaching out to us to let them know that they're still in dangerous conditions. Unfortunately, we did not get folks safer in COVID. As you can imagine, it's actually worse than ever. So um, that's just something we're gonna have to keep focusing on this year. But I think all in all, this has been a really successful campaign. And we really were super lucky to have you guys be so supportive of us. Um, that we could not have done anything that we did without the Austin, Texas chapter, like just 100% getting behind us. So I just want to say thank you guys so much because we're still just learning and uh, we have a meeting on Tuesday. So come meet us if you want to come hang out. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, so next up, um, we're going to have uh, the Eviction Solidarity Network, Sol Eviction Solidarity Network uh, report back from Mike. Take it away. Mike's not here. That's okay. Oh, Mike's not here? Yeah. Let's just go to the next one if he gets here. Okay. All and right. Um, opportunity to say that um, there are short summaries of all these campaigns in the convention packet as well. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if you're interested in that campaign, um, 
yeah, the convention packet. Um, so yeah, next up is the safe school reopening teacher organizing by Tandra. So hi, Tandra. Hey y'all, uh, Tandra Louie, she, her pronouns. Um, so yeah, around August, uh, some members of LC and some labor organizers in Austin DSA realized that shit was gonna be bad because our school districts hadn't done any preparations since March. Um, and we felt like we needed to do DSA is uh, gonna be an important part of organizing teachers and the community. Um, so we started off with reading uh, Red State Revolt, which I think was a great way to start the organizing because it really put in perspective, perspective that this wasn't gonna be a win after three months, right? Like we, in Red State Revolt, West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma, LA, um, all these teachers and organizers emphasize that it took years for them to get to the point where they could go on a successful strike. Um, so that was a big relief for me. I was like, oh no, it's no way we're gonna get AIC teachers to strike before December uh, and that, because that's not realistic. So our goals were to um, get rank and file organizers in our schools. Uh, so to really build up the labor movement in Austin and Central Texas and Texas abroad. So we had, we started a Texas call for, um, it had members in Austin, Houston, San Antonio and El Paso, uh, teachers and parents just really, at first it was like event space. People were really stressed out about going back into person for teaching and, uh, the wealth divide between our students uh, as far as like internet access and computer access and parents who were essential workers and childcare and just like all the things all at once. Um, so rank and file members um, and labor organizing was really important in this uh, campaign and also just as socialists knowing that we couldn't trust capitalists to keep our teachers and our students safe and They've proven this. Um, so there, we don't have a finish line yet. <laughs> like this finish line will be a robust labor uprising in Texas. And so that's on our horizon for DSA. Um, but I think we have been successful in that we are starting to have these deeper conversations of what we want our education system to look like in Texas and in Austin. And um, we worked with Education Austin, the Austin uh, Union, and they're pretty powerful. After going to meetings with um, other teachers from different cities, apparently a lot of people really look up to Education Austin and Ken Zaffer is their uh, chair. and. Um, yeah, but you know, things have just been devastating. Um, and currently TA wants um, everyone to go back into person for the star testing. And we all know that's ridiculous and absurd. Um, so we do have a long fight in front of us regarding um, what we should do as socialists and what should we do as educators and teachers. And I know a lot of us don't have kids, but it's been important that we realize that as community members, we definitely need to care about what's happening to all our families. Um, so yeah, I'm just excited about what DSA is gonna do this coming up year and how we can continue to fight with Education Austin and how we can continue to push Education Austin to have more of a socialist outlook with organizing um, in their schools. Awesome, great report back. Um, so next up is uh, the Greg Kassar for Austin City Council campaign from Madeline. Hey y'all. Um, okay, we, yes. Um, so yeah, this was an interesting one because it's an incumbent DSA member who had no real competition um, in his race. So there was never really any real concern that he wouldn't win. Um, so the goal was, you know, winning, but obviously that was a pretty, easy part. So really the goal was, you know, mobilizing our forces and getting out and talking to people about some of the issues that we've led with, with Greg, that Greg and I, Greg and DSA, Austin DSA have led on, such as recriminalizing, oh my God, decriminalizing homelessness um, and defunding the police and paid, sick, or and other, you know, work, working class initiatives like paid sick leave. It was, you know, I would say that we, didn't really meet those goals. Um, I think because of 
the pandemic and um, the kind of timing that the endorsement hit and where our organizing was, we didn't fully, you know, the, the kind of responsibility for getting sort of that, that level of organizing together, um, it wasn't exactly, um, it wasn't exactly, uh, the, the, the responsibility for the campaign didn't, I think because it was kind of a, a like hot, but not hot potato, but like everyone just kind of knew Greg and knew that he was gonna win. So I think there was kind of this sense that like, you know, it was kind of, somebody else has it. Um, so, you know, in the future, I would think that we would do a lot more organizing if we are, I think it's a pretty rare situation to run a socialist and know that he's going to win. So, but in situations that are like that, I think we'll have to, you know, do a lot more organizing ahead of time to figure out what our real plan is. And hopefully we'll be able to knock doors in future elections like this, because I learned from trying to volunteer organize during that, that um, people do not like phone banking very much. <laughs> so yeah, maybe our chapter should get a little better at phone banking as well. Um, uh, but overall, you know, he's still in office and we, he's still a DSA member. So there's a lot to be happy about. Great, uh, thanks, Madeline. Um, I'm really excited this for this next one. As I'm a transit worker, uh, this one is uh, Robert F. with the report back on Prop A for a light rail bond. Hello, everyone. I'm going to keep this one really quickly just to keep us on time. But uh, yeah, we had a small campaign. It was great. We used everything that we learned from the Heidi campaign, the Bernie campaign, all the campaigns we did over the summer. Um, thank you to everyone that helped. Um, and we did some relational organizing, some text banking, some phone banking, put up some signs. And overall, it was really nice. Turns out that we won by quite a bit. Um, my one critique is we should have started this campaign um, three months earlier, but um, three months earlier, we we're still getting beat and chased by the police in the streets of Austin. So, um, you know, it was a busy summer. So um, it was a great campaign. And thank you guys all so much for helping and for all the organizational capacity that we built up to allow this campaign to happen. And we are gonna have trains in seven years so yay great thanks thanks robert with the uh, record for the uh, quick quick report back bringing us back on time appreciate that um so next up is uh the anti-save austin now a report back from marina hey y'all so my name is Marina Roberts. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I am a public school teacher and a union member. I am the former co-chair of DSA's housing committee. Um, I understand the structure of some of our committees is gonna be evolving with this, uh, you know, our, our recent bylaws rewrite. But back in the day, one of the biggest victories that we won was the decriminalization of homelessness in Austin through rewriting three city ordinances that governed behaviors that are essentially unavoidable to people living on the street, right? So panhandling, which is asking for money, sitting or lying, and then also camping outside. So whenever we won this campaign, there was an immediate backlash of vicious lies. So um, cops, the GOP, and the Downtown Austin Alliance, which essentially represents business interests and real estate interests in Austin's downtown, came together and basically uh, led what could only be described as a coordinated effort to use the rewriting of city ordinances to respect the constitutional and human rights of people living on the street. Um, as an opportunity to make a, you know, an opportunistic power grab for the right in Austin. So they were lying, they were manipulating people. Um, you know, there was a massive failure of corporate media who just sort of, you know, quoted everybody except for people on the street, right? Um, you know, gave them a massive platform to mislead the public about what these ordinances had done. And out of that backlash, came an organization called Save Austin Now. So Save Austin Now is a coalition of um, Safe Horns, which is a you know, sort of parent group at uh, UT Austin, a, the Travis County GOP chair, Matt Makoviak, um, also known as Boss Baby, 
and uh, a number of homeowners. And then the sort of cherry on top is a is like a dingus token lib who is there only, you know, to allow this coalition to be called a bipartisan coalition, right? And so what Save Austin Now sought to do was uh, collect signatures for this bogus ballot petition in order to get recriminalizing homelessness on the ballot in May. So um, they actually, the first time that they attempted this was over the summer. And so what we did as, you know, basically as this sort of slapdash effort that Seneca was a huge part of, so, you know, shout out to him. Um, we infiltrated their email lists and used that to collect information. Um, we monitored their Facebook groups to figure out where they were going to be collecting signatures and we basically counter canvassed them. So, um, you know, combating their narrative in the public was very important, but the counter canvassing was the thing that I was a very, very big part of. So um, in the course of counter canvassing them, um, we encountered some truly nasty, despicable people. They insulted my physical appearance. Um, they demeaned my family. Um, they accused me of lying. So whenever we got into conversations with voters, they would just be like, don't listen to her, she's crazy. And um, they also called the cops on me and Seneca many, many times. So really bad people. And we witnessed them lying to voters over and over and over again. So this anti-homeless organization was pulling the wool over the public's eyes by telling them that this petition was to help the homeless, y'all. So that if you have heard anything negative about this organization, the negative reputation of Save Austin now is a direct consequence of the organizing that we did. And so over the summer, because of the organizing that we did, um, we basically stopped them from getting on the ballot. There was this razor thin margin um, where they got pretty close, but didn't quite cut it. And we know very, very, you know, for, for sure that it was because of the work that we did. So we were able to basically expose Save Austin Now as partisan, um, deceptive and fraudulent and stop them the first time. Unfortunately, um, you know, they, they've just submitted signatures again. And so it's possible that for the May ballot, they will get on the ballot, right? So uh, without taking up too much time, y'all, housing is a human right. So long as anybody is on the street, none of us are free. Um, the threat of homelessness is a form of psychological terrorism that is wielded against the working class, right? Um, my brother lives on the street. My mama has experienced homelessness for years of her life. Uh, and I think that it's, it's on us very much to step up and put this shit down if they make it onto the ballot, right? If they don't make it onto the ballot, it is as a direct result of the organizing, the boots on the ground work, um, the coalition building and the commitment to the values of solidarity of this chapter. So thank you all so much. Please, uh, you know, if you have any questions, hit me up. Great, um, thanks Marina. Um, and next up uh, is gonna be Ash Khan with the uh, Neighborhood Organizing Report Back. Thanks, we're on time comrades. I don't see assembly member Forrest on yet, so, but I'll, I know she's about to speak, so I'll be brief. Um, Austin DSA members are always really excited about figuring out how we can connect the really like ambitious national international project that we're working on to the local level. And I think that's critical. And um, there's a little bit more information in the convention packet, but um, the, well, the main point is just that we tried to organize some neighborhood pods at the beginning of the pandemic to kind of both spread socialism and uh, see if we could get some mutual aid done. That was a really interesting opportunity and, and with, some, with some success. And now I just, the main purpose of telling you this is that we have Austin DSA neighborhood group chats that if you post about in Slack, we can get you into, there are kind of uh, 10 of them throughout the city. I don't want to take up any more time from our keynote speaker. Thanks so much, comrades. What a, we make our chapter seem like a powerhouse of socialist organizing. That's so awesome. Great. I mean, it is. Wait, just give me one second. Just one second. Hello. We'll introduce you. Yeah, we'll, which will give you time. Yeah. Yeah, do Madeline or Ashkan or someone else want to do the, do the intro? Yeah, go ahead, Madeline. Yeah, Graham. Um, I got that. So thank you. Or so welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us, um, Assemblywoman uh, Forrest. So proud to have you. Um, like I was saying during my opening, uh, unfortunately, our, for our movement, we don't have a lot of real power right now. 
but it turns out we can do a lot with our chapters and with and with like you know the amount of people that are organizing and are paying attention right now and we can do a lot with the races that we keep winning <laughs> so yeah because capitalism is so amazing and rational and totally not exploiting us at all uh, a little bit of working class power can actually be wielded pretty creatively into amazing ends, you know, because it's just such a like stable system that is totally not, uh, you know, obviously killing us all. Um, but yeah, so one of the most inspiring and amazing stories of the past year was this sweep of New York City DSA members running for New York State Assembly. And people didn't really, uh, expect all of them to win, but they ran on an amazing campaign along strong class lines and yeah, kicked ass. So Barrett is super cool. Uh, she's a healthcare worker, a tenant organizer and socialist. And I am so proud to be in the same movement with her. So Assemblywoman um, for, Forrest, please uh, take it away. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Super excited to be here with you all. I am really excited that I was invited to speak um, because I think if you ask uh, all the Slate members that, um, that I now call friends, um, yes, welcome to Austin. By the way, I didn't get to Austin. I got to Dallas, um, Fort Worth. So I hope to visit Austin. I think it would be more my vibe anyways. Um, so, Anybody want to let me crash on their couch post COVID? Let me know. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, as far as um, yeah, so my slate members, we all have different paths to um, I guess politics. But I think what really um, guides us all that the same path we took is through organizing, and which is the path that. I honestly think is the only way to build lasting power in um, in anything, anything. Um, naturally, we're humans. Um, if you even look from on a cellular level, we are organizing creatures. So to hear that anybody talks about individualism or even the idea of capitalism, that's utter bullshit. It goes the it goes against the very nature of how we as humans are formed. So. Um, I'm really glad to be about among like-minded um, people that say fuck capitalism. Okay, so with that said, um, today I really wanted to talk to you about building power for the working class people because in my experiencing organizing, campaigning, and now being an assembly woman, that's what I've been doing, the root of it all. Um, so to be really, really concrete, I want to tell you the story about how I got involved in tenant organizing, right? A little bit back, back track. Um, even organizing as a youth, right? So when I was in high school, I remember my friend, um, it was undocumented. I never understood what that meant because we all... I've been in school with her since I was in pre-K and we got to high school and we were cool, like we were great. And um, when it came down to choices of school, I was talking about, oh, maybe I could go to, um, remember at the time I wanted to go to Spelman, I wanted to go to Dartmouth, you know, there was options, right, for me. But for her, her only option and the only option for her brother was the community college up the block. And I felt that that was very unfair. And um, I remember I was talking to my teacher about it and she was like, well, you know, you can do something about that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to go knock on Dortmouth door. I don't think I can do that and tell them to let my friend in. Um, but this, well, this teacher introduced me to the, not only an organization called Global Kids, but the idea of organizing what we can do as a group, right? And so I'm sure all of you have heard of the DREAM Act, but when I first started organizing around the DREAM Act, I know, right? She's an awesome person. Um, but when I first started around organizing around the DREAM Act, it really was this idea of 
young people coming together and saying it's not fair it's not fair at all that my friend does not have the same opportunity as me right we don't have the same opportunities and that was the story that students across new york city were saying teachers were saying professionals were saying and it was really you know to see that that same story was being echoed across the United States, right? In California and hearing what was going down as far as organizing in Florida, like you really felt like you were swept up into this movement of united voices. And so when later on, right, you know, through college organizing around women's rights, women's issues, um, racial justice, and then going into now I'm out of school, I am working. Um, it seemed like, you know, when we were having happy hours with my friends on Friday nights, we were like, wait, mm, we're all going home to our mamas, right? Because <laughs> we cannot afford to move out. And then, um, so that was one theme that kept on running in the back of my mind that we can't move, we can't, here we are, we were told we were promised mobility once you graduate high school, I mean college, but I can't even move out my mom's bedroom, my, 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 my mom's living room, excuse me, because I lived in the living room. <laughs> um, and so it was like, okay, now what? Um, so when they, um, when my building decided to give me a notice, give the tenants a notice saying that they were going from luxury buildings, from rent stabilized apartments to luxury condos. I immediately got scared because I said, well, in if I leave here or am I, if I'm kicked out of here, where will I go? Where will everyone go? Because if me with a college degree cannot afford the rent, then what will happen to my, to, to my neighbors, my friends, the people that I've lived with for the past 30, at the time, 27 years. So it really, it was like, a oh no, like there's a, a panic that's set in. But one thing that organizing has taught me any organizing is that once you identify the problem, you can then assess the tools that you have to then address the problem, right? And then also as a nurse, right? That's what we're taught is to assess, plan, implement, intervene, and evaluate. So it's really part of organizing around a problem. Uh, it, it, that's the, it doesn't change no matter what you come across. So I was like, okay, well, let's get my tenants together. And so we had our initial meetings um, where we talked to tenants. I, I, I called the first tenant association meeting and I was just like, okay, so what are we gonna do guys? What are we gonna do? And um, it, it grew into something where my building then was connected to the Crown Heights Tenants Union and here I have tenants that, first of all, didn't even know the state of their lease, who were being subjected to harassment, who were being kicked out. I had a woman who was kicked out at three, at the time she was five months pregnant in the middle of um, February out because she just didn't know that she had a right to occupy the apartment that her roommate left her. So. The, it's, it's, it's this idea that here we were this set of tenants and now once we got together and shared information and understood that we had a pillar of justice and rights to stand on that we were able then to transform into tenants on the move and so um, tenants from my building joined the Crown Heights Tenants Union went to different rallies but for me particularly, I knew that I had a skill in training people. My, I think, you know, teaching is the best way to show how you've learned something, right? So I began teaching people about their rights and going into different um, 
different spaces and doing trainings. And so one thing I wanna point out about organizing, you can't do it all, you cannot do it all and you shouldn't do it all. It's really just fundamentally looking at yourself and how you want to, part, to take part in this. So no, I was never really a rally kind of girl because I, I, I'm delicate. Um, I can't run. If some, something pop off, I cannot run, okay? But I knew that I could reach people and in small groups or larger groups and make sure they leave with the information that's necessary. So um, if, if someone told me Barra would be, um, one second, Charles. If somebody would tell me that today I'd be assemblywoman, first of all, I just got, I at the time, 2017, I just graduated nursing school. I was trying to make my money, okay? I was just trying to chill. I was trying to live my life being a luxurious little mess. But <laughs> again, um, when you really become part of the movement, it calls you. It calls you to, um, I mean, really, if you're interacting with humans, you, you, you cannot be shaped, you cannot help but be shaped by what's around you, right? if that makes any kind of sense. Um, when it came, so there was a call, right? Democratic Socialists of America was looking for candidates. At the time, was I, did I think I even was a socialist? No, I was not. <laughs> even though I was a sociology minor, <laughs> I was not a, socio a, a socialist, okay? Um, no, I, 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 the color red, I don't even like wearing red like that anyway. So I was like, okay, um, I'm doing these tenants movement, to tenants meetings. I'm part of this coalition for the Housing Justice for All Coalition, traveling to New York, uh, to Albany, and, and, and do, going here, going there. And then I was just like, you know, these people are cool. I'm making friends. Hey, hey, how you doing? You know, collectivism is the best. But not one time did I really hear the word socialism until somebody was like, Farrah, come, we're, we're doing something, we need to talk to you. And then I was like, what's a social, democratic socialist of America? What's that? And then, you know, I'm talking to certain people and this person's like, oh, I'm part of DSA. I'm like, what? Oh, I'm part of DSA, I'm part of DSA. I'm like, but you're not a socialist. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, you're not a socialist. And then I eventually I realized, no, it's not that they're not a socialist, it's that you are a socialist, Farah. You are part of this and it's, 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 it's in your blood now. And so when it kind of dawned on me that I was a socialist, then it kind of made sense to run as a socialist candidate. Um, and I'm looking at Tendera's face right now. So she's on my view right now and it's like killing me because I'm like, it really fell on my lap. And that's what's so beautiful about it, um, which I find so beautiful about my pro pro progress, is that I literally grew out of the movement and then formed this identity for myself. Yes, I'm a Black woman, I'm a Pan-Africanist, but ultimately the way that I work is deeply, deeply rooted in the idea that as a working class people, we must work together to make sure we uplift ourselves and to fight back against bosses, right? <laughs> bosses in whatever forms it is, whether it's landlord, whether it's the guy you're clocking in out of whatever. Um, the very fact that we have bosses call of president, uh, ex-president Trump, like bosses we must fight against. And so um, that's how I got into office. There's a whole, you know, I, they knocked on my door one time I got into a car accident they knocked on my door next time I was like no leave me alone I nearly died the last time I talked to you guys so finally you know when I went to Albany the last time and there was the rent stabilization laws um they were voting on the rent stabilization laws in New York to pro extend pro stronger protections for rent stabilized, rent stabilized tenants and make them permanent that day, I, along with uh, 60 other people, went up to get arrested in Albany. 
I know I'm acting blase. I was scared. I was shook. But we all got arrested. And that was the plan. I was supposed to go, here you go, officer. Have a good time. But, um, and then you're at pizza after. But <laughs> that is not how it ended up. Um, there was a lot of violence that day. I got kicked in the back. Um, people got choked out, ended up in the hospital. People got kept in Albany. Um, and so at that point, I was like, I'm not asking for you to do anything that's special. I pay the rent every month. I just wanna make sure that when I pay the rent, I get a little dignity um, with it. With my, with my pay, please give me dignity. Please don't let me live with roaches. Please make sure you don't harass me and knock on my door and say goons, uh, you know, to, 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 to mess up my tenant association meetings. Respect please. And so at that point when it was like, I guess what I'm really asking for is to be treated as a human and you can't even see that. And then to see elected officials stand on the side like this, bruh, you gotta go, you gotta go. So at that point I decided to then run for office. Um, and at that point I decided that my agency was best in office. So running as part of a slate was the best thing. Um, if you, it, when, okay, so they told me to talk about how much money I raised and all that stuff, but, but, but that's not really what, what is so important about, um, running, um, is the technicalities of it. If you want the details of that, you could just raise your hand and I'll give you that. But I will say how much did I raise for my campaign? Yes, I did raise about $150,000 um, in total. That's what is on my filings, $154,000. You're saying, wow, no, <laughs> it was a struggle. <laughs> okay, this is why I wanted, to, did I have to take out a loan? Nope, you do not, you cannot take out loans for, um, you cannot take out loans. So why I started off with, a slate, why this was important. When I first met Jabari Brisport, um, we were, were put together and we're like, they were like, yeah, y'all are, the strategy is y'all gonna run together. And I'm like, but I don't know Jabari, he's not my friend, I'm, he's not kin to me, I don't know him. So we sat down and we had this meet and greet and him and I, and he ran for city council before and there was a point of the day where we're, we're chatting and he's like, Farah, to be honest, running for office is, not, is, is hard, but it's hard in a sense that you thinking you're hitting a brick wall until you realize that it's paper thin. And that stuck in my head forever, like stuck in my head then. And that's something I wanna tell you what it is now. When you're running for office, the most important thing is to be zero, like to have a zero focus, like focus, like blinders on because people will throw things at you. Yes, at one, at 2 p.m., ooh, yeah. Um, people will throw things at you. People will talk about you. They will say anything. I have gone to meetings where I raised up $32,000 and Mrs. is like, well, that's nothing. I'm like, I can actually hire a chief of staff now. What you talking about? That's nothing. But people will try to derail you, but you have to stay focused. So yes, I raised $154,000 up to the point of my June filings, but I will tell you in April, my bank account was looking like 50, okay? And my chief of staff was eating, my, 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 my campaign manager had to be paid. There was at one point where I was like, Listen, Tasha, Nathan, y'all might have to go on unemployment, okay? Y'all might have to go on unemployment. This is when that pandemic was hot. This is what, I mean, running for office was not easy and running for office as a socialist nurse was not easy. But again, you hit the wall, you hit it every day with your story, your truth. I'm a housing advocate, that's what I talk about. I'm a nurse, I talk about health. I don't know the lingo about that budget, but I'm not going to pretend to know it. 
I'm just gonna be an open book as far as you can write it in and I will transcribe whatever I know or I've learned. You understand what I'm saying? Like it was not, and it was very an informed process. Like I went to groups and I asked, hey, how do I do this or how do I do that? And then they told me and I spoke and I, and it was like a very, and it was very informed process, like movement informed. I did not go to a consultant. I did not go to this guru campaign person here. It was really, it was really informed and it was a collaborative. Yeah, there we go. Collaborative effort. And I really leaned on my slate. So if it's anything you get out of this, Austin is, don't send your candidate alone. Please run together. <laughs> throw, throw, I don't know if it's three, four, but please run together. Um, campaigning as a, oh yeah, so oh, good. Yeah, I'm hitting the points. Okay, good. Being off, okay, so what is it like to be in office now? So now that I'm a socialist nurse, now politician. So it's interesting how people talk to me. They're like, oh, Assemblywoman Farrah Forrest, hello. I'm like, first of all, it's Farrah because in truth, I work for you. And they're like, oh, that's just a party slogan. No, 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 for real, I work for you because you see, I'm just one person and I have three staffs, right? As a Assemblywoman, I only get three pairs of staffs to try to govern not only 149,000 constituents, but also represent these 149,000 people in Albany with, um, at least 150 uh, 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 colleagues. So that's nearly impossible. So I need the community to be with me. So we have structured our office differently where I say that my space, my office is a community, is an outreach, is an organizing space. So for example, we had our first legal clinic for around housing. So what does that mean? I say, hello group, um, you, legal consulting company and they call MLB, whatever. So I said MLB come in, they provided the service of one-on-one -on -one trainings, right? A one-on-one -on -one sessions with um, constituents. But then on the other side, I had someone come in from the Housing Justice Coalition to actually provide a, a, a presentation on this very important important um, form that my constituents need to fill out, which is to sit, to declare hardship, right? Once you sign this form saying that I suffered during COVID and I can't pay the rent, you can take this legal document to the courts and then this helps protect you from being evicted. So this is a very important form that no one in my district seems to know about, but I needed to make sure that they know about it. So how do I draw them in? I can't say come talk about this form, but I said I have free legal services, but really I want my, I want the housing justice um, coalition to come in and talk to you, not only give you the information, but then organize you to action. Can you now take this form back to your building and disseminate it amongst your neighbors? See, legislators like me, like legislators before me never do this they never do this because they only see it as this is cutting into my mailer, but why am I cutting into my mailer's budget when I have constituents that are already organized that care and now I can help them, teach them to even help themselves. So that is um, how, I for, how I base my office. Um, my, I, I think my, I, I don't call, yes, I have a chief of staff, but my, um, the real title for my um, staff is organizers. Um, organizers who know how to motivate, agitate, um, coll collaborate to make sure that change happens and that each and every constituent, if they feel like they can rise to that, be um, agents of change for themselves. So um, that's one thing that that's how we make our office. And my advice to build this, to have, to be very frank, um, I think that our strength, right, 
our strength as DSA members is very much, you know, we have a very open democratic process in everything. I mean, even pizza for a meeting is a democratic process. Yes, Leah, smile. It's it's a it's a democratic process, but it is something that other people cannot fathom in their brain. You know what I mean? They cannot understand that when we do endorsements, it's actually us members that choose our met who we choose to endorse, right? Um, and so when we're building this, it's very important for us to remain as inclusive as possible, as inclusive. The door knocking, right, canvassing is the most important thing, I think, when building um, collectivism. People are not used to being, a, to being addressed as, hello, how, hi. Um, especially in New York City, <laughs> we don't say hi. And so once you take that initiative to step up to somebody and say hi, and they respond back, that is the most mm, moment. Now, what you do after that, um, it depends on what you're trying to, you know, you know, accomplish. When my door was knocked, it was literally knocked by, some, I don't know if anybody knows, um, the OC for New York City, but Sumathi um, knocked on my door years and years ago, right? And she did not knock on my door saying, hi, I'm from DSA. We're like a de socially democratic. She literally knocked on my door and said, hi, I heard that your building, your tenants are going through some things. And I just wanna know, are you okay? And that, is super, super important to how we actually start to build power because people aren't asked questions. One of the most biggest things that changed my campaign for me was when I picked up the phone and called people, not to say, Farah, you are a, a Farah is running for office here and she, this is her legislative priorities. No, it was literally like, hey, how are you? There's a pandemic outside. Are you okay? Can I connect you to services? And then, when I connected, when we were able to get past through the crisis moment, people said they didn't have any problems, whatever, but some people did. Then I was able to say, okay, so now that you're cool, we have a candidate, Farah, who wants to make sure you're cool for a long time. And da 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 da, da right? So, um, advice, that's my advice for building. The initial stage is go everywhere, okay? If you haven't been to that person's door physically or in some way touch that community, it is not for you to then think you own it because you cannot, listen to what I'm saying. You cannot say that you own that community. You cannot say that you know that person until you actually physically touch their life. You touch, you, you touch them. If it's a hello, or you, you you drop the flyer, I don't, and a lot of people don't understand that. They think that, or like, for example, you know, some of our other candidates, they think, oh, because they are part of this group, they're automatically going to support you. No, they're not. You don't know their story. Again, I'm a black woman, but I'm also a socialist. So you cannot automatically think I'm gonna vote on the democratic line. Mm -mm if you start talking about housing justice for all, if you start talking about cancel the rent, you got me, defund NYPD, you got me. You understand? You don't know until you talk to me. So um, that's my um, spiel on, um, oh, good, I made it till two o'clock so I can go to the inauguration. But um, that's my spiel on how to build this. If I went too long, I'm so sorry. Um, but it really, really excite me, excites me to talk about how to build power. Um, it's not complicated. It's actually quite simple. It's so simple that it's, it's, it's overlooked. And if you, um, as a chapter, I really, really encourage you to take your time 
and talk about, use the very processes that you, you have built and use this as the basis for everything, both choosing candidates, pushing them through fundraising, to then when they're in office, how do you support your candidate? Um, I would also very happy to always talk about that another day, but don't think that what you're doing right now is nothing. It's hard work, but this is how we change the world. This is how we get five socialists into Albany, five. And if we count Emily Gallagher, six, too. but five, like we really did get five, all five of us went in. Um, and so I am so proud of the work in Austin. I do like the things that y'all be posting on Twitter. And so um, please, you know, invite me anytime. Would love the Albany perspective. I just want to make sure I last minute question. Oh, cool. yes, uh, good. I got everybody, great. So um, thank you. Did, was there a Q and A po posted for this or not? I'm good, no, okay, cool, yay. So thank you so much everyone for inviting me and anytime call me back. <laughs> thank you so much. We enjoyed it a lot and yeah, enjoy the inauguration.